Um, this is a panel that we've been excited for for a couple of weeks. Um, and really, it couldn't be more timely, truly. Um, this is the thing that impacts this industry the most right now. Um, and today we're joined by uh, three really amazing humans who are all approaching and attacking this uh, legislative effort and this educational effort, this grassroots policy and programming effort from the ground up and from three very different verticals. So um, I'm, I'm very excited to introduce uh, uh, David All. Darren Carter and Marissa Koppel, um, each of whom are just phenomenal fighters for, for, for the crypto industry. And, and welcome to all three of you. Thanks so much for being here. Yeah, thanks for having us. Thanks, Robbie. Yeah, thank you. Um, I do want to just start this conversation with a quick disclaimer. It's important to note that there's ongoing legislation happening right now, and we would like for our audience here to be just extra cautious when asking questions. Um, there will be a limitation to what our panelists can really respond to when it comes to ongoing litigation. And and, and so we just ask that people uh, remain courteous and conscientious and understanding of that um, as you're putting in your questions. And, and really what's nice about the cross section of people that we have here is that we're able to sort of talk about these enforcement actions um, without putting um, our dear friend Darren into a position where he has to comment on ongoing litigation. So just a heads up and um, and yeah, thank you in advance, Darren, for being willing to do this and, and to Coinbase for being open to having this conversation. Yeah, of course, I'm excited to have a conversation and appreciate uh, the opportunity to share what we've been working on um, and also appreciate the disclaimer. Um, but I think it's obviously more important now than ever to spark that type of discourse yeah. Um, and just thankful for the opportunity to speak here at the state of crypto philanthropy. So, yeah. Right on. Well, Darren, why don't you keep the mic? Tell us who you are, a little bit about what, awesome. what you do and, and your role at Coinbase. Cool. I'll, uh, I'll very briefly give my full intro here. Uh, my name is Darren Carter. I lead our uh, grassroots and uh, community engagement team on the policy team. I've been with Coinbase for almost four years now, so I'll be four in about four weeks. Um, but this is my first six months on the policy team, um, studied information security at Penn State. I'll explain why that M is there uh, a little bit later. Um, but really this week, sorry, this week, this, um, this year, we've really been focused on our grassroots advocacy efforts. So our Stand With Crypto campaign uh, has been myself, our team, um, some partnership with our product team as well, um, and then some other in-person direct with policymaker initiatives um, are launching, I'd say really hitting the ground running uh, this August. So August recess will be really big for us, um, but excited to just speak overall to what we've been building um, and then really just like why right. uh, we think this is really important. That's awesome. Thanks for being here, Darren. Um, uh, yeah. uh, Marissa. Thanks, Robbie. Um, hi, everyone. Thanks for tuning in. I'm Marissa Koppel. I'm senior counsel at the Blockchain Association. We are the largest trade association in the space. Very proud to call endowment one of our members. Um, so a trade association, just like at a very high level, is a membership organization. All of our members are crypto native companies, uh, which means we don't have any members who are like traditional financial institutions who might have a crypto product. They're all like, you know, 100% crypto. And we advocate on behalf of our members on the Hill and in other policy making arenas. Um, like in the courts, we submit amicus briefs supporting other people in the industry who might be in active litigation. Uh, we also send FOIA requests and comment on proposed rulemaking. So we are based in DC and you know I live in the crypto policy legal world and I'm excited to share my insight and also to hear the insight of my other panelists too. 
Right on. Thank you, Marissa. Um, we'll get right back to you in a second, because I think you're going to need to kick us off. But before we do that, David, tell us a little bit about yourself. Welcome. Hey, everyone. Good to be here. I'm based in Washington, D.C. Uh, you know, this is where I started my career about 20 years ago, a speechwriter in the U.S. Senate for Ohio Senator George V. Voinovich. And then after a couple of years, jumped over to the House of Representatives in House leadership and uh, worked for a, mentor, a mentee of Newt Gingrich, who was always fascinated by alternative media. And so I took on really that role of helping the Republicans, the House Republicans, and pretty much everyone on the, on the campaign trails and everywhere else kind of start to figure out social media and how Web2 could be leveraged to get the messages out further, right? How to reach more voters with issues that matter to them. And started the first social media agency in DC, worked with all sorts of politicians all around the world around issues that they care about, getting them elected. Worked with a lot of the large trade associations, uh, the pharma of the world, you know, the CEAs, uh, the Sound Exchange, um, and then also like the Burning Man organization, which is a large arts uh, entity. And oddly enough, they're also the largest event on federal land. And so working with them to come to DC and tell their story from the point of view of their economic impact in Reno um, and how big that is and how many jobs just that event alone helps create. So yeah, always helping shift narratives, um, got involved with blockchain around 2014 um, and then 2017 uh, worked with the team around writing a white paper for an NFT marketplace. And then 2021 started building Change Gallery. And Change Gallery is leveraging the Ethereum blockchain to help artists make their social impact in the world. And we're really proud and, you know, it's really great to work with experts like Endowment and the Giving Block that already service the nonprofit world so well. And what we identified was that no one was really servicing the artists and the change makers very specifically around when they want to make an impact, when they want to say something with their art and make a social impact. And so that's what we're focused around is bringing people to the table. And uh, yeah, it's exciting to be here. Thanks for being here, David. Um, it's exciting to have you and your experience is just so far reaching. It'll be really cool to see how it layers into this conversation. It was definitely cool in the prep. So um, for everybody who's just joining or is coming coming late to the state of crypto philanthropy, I'm Robbie Heger. I am the president and CEO of Endowment, um, a community foundation that is sponsoring today's event, um, as well as uh, the first 501c3 operating fully on chain. We use smart contracts to administer donor advice funds, community funds, and fundraising endpoints for nonprofits. Um, so with the intros out of the way, I wanna go straight to Marissa. And Marissa, we have like really newsworthy action going on right now. There is the stablecoin bill. There is the McHenry market structure bill. Uh, there are all sorts of SEC enforcement actions going down left and right. Uh, can you walk us through each of those two bills and what, and, and sort of the summary of what's happening with these enforcement actions? Yeah, for sure. Um, and I should preface this also by giving my disclaimer that I always give before I speak to anyone who isn't a client, but I am a lawyer and but nothing what th that I say here should be taken as legal advice. Um, so that's just my little disclaimer. Um, so I guess to start, there's these like two paths of policymaking that we're seeing in the crypto space. One is through, well, I guess three paths. One is through legislation, which happens through Congress. And this is putting aside state policy because there's a lot happening there too, but I mostly focus on what's happening federally. So one path is legislation, which is what's happening in Congress. Another path is when regulatory agencies like the SEC or the CFTC or the Treasury Department publish some sort of rulemaking. So that's like regulations. And then there's this third path, which is policymaking that happens within our court system. And with the crypto industry, because we haven't seen a lot of rulemaking, there's been a lot more happening in the courts, especially from the SEC. 
So since Chair Gensler uh, was appointed as chair and confirmed, you know, he's sort of been on a crusade to uh, like take down the industry. And we've just been seeing more and more enforcement actions, even before he came on board, when Chair Clayton was chair, there was, that was during the ICO boom and the SEC brought a lot of enforcement actions regarding ICOs. But we've seen that expanded and especially recently in the recent enforcement actions against um, the two large crypto exchanges, Coinbase and Kraken. Um, so it's sort of been, it's broadened other than ICOs to now be expanded to not just token issuers, but also exchanges, which are places that are um, like selling or trading where you can sell or trade a token. Um and, and so maybe just, Marissa, just to pause there. So th the enforcement actions are the big news grabbing headline, right? Like that's what everybody's been clamoring about. Like I, 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 I know that for me, it really helps when people break down like what's happening in these enforcement actions in like the simplest terms possible. Like what are they alleging against these exchanges, both Coinbase and Binance? Yeah, so both of those cases are enforcement actions brought by the SEC. And to step back, um, just like to provide some context, the SEC is the Securities Exchange Commission, and they regulate the securities industry um, and, you know, buying and selling and trading of securities in the United States. So there's several different laws that um, like compose the securities laws. There's the Exchange Act, there's the Securities Act. There's an act registering um, investment advisors, so like VCs, and the SEC has the authority to um, enforce any violate enforce against any violations of those laws. So in the Coinbase and the Binance actions, they're alleging that both of those companies and its two separate actions violated the securities laws in some form. Okay. And yeah, so like. And and so like, is there like a common violation that they're doing like, or or is it that like a token that they've listed is a is problematic? Like, is this kind of like they're, they're, they're kind of attacking the platform for the, for listing the asset that isn't in their control, right? Right. So in order for the SEC to have jurisdiction over Coinbase and Binance, Coinbase and Binance have to be listing securities. So okay. a question that's central to both of these complaints is whether the tokens that are named in the complaints constitute securities. Um, and in this crypto context, typically we define a security, like there's many different types of securities, but one type is called an investment contract. And if you've heard of a test called the Howey test, which is based on this right. yep. from the 40s about orange groves, it lays out the factors that the SEC has to prove in order for a court to find that, you know, these tokens are securities. So th those are like, um, that's like a central question in both of these complaints. But the SEC has not done any rulemaking and Congress has not yet passed any legislation that helps answer the question of when a digital asset constitutes a security. Because a digital asset, as I'm sure all of you know, I mean, this technology is totally novel and there are things involved in this technology that it just doesn't quite fit with the current securities laws. So we need some more, and sorry for the siren outside, if you can hear it, I don't know. But we need oh, yeah. some more um, guidance as to like understanding how to apply the current law to this new technology. And Chair Gensler, instead of doing like helpful rulemaking, he's instead taken this position that all tokens other than Bitcoin are securities despite like each one, there's a very fact intensive analysis. He sort of like blatantly stated that all tokens except for Bitcoin are securities. And he has brought a number of different enforcement actions, which then other projects in the industry 
now have to essentially read between the lines of these enforcement actions to understand how the SEC views right. the law. Right. Okay. So that's the enforcement actions. I think I have my head wrapped around that. I see David and Darren shaking their head as well. And and don't think for a minute that even if you work full time in this space, that these are easy concepts to to wrap your head around. So I'm definitely you know learning alongside everybody here. And Marissa, just to have your perspective is so helpful here. And so I want to stay with you just for a little bit longer, and then I promise we'll open this up because I think you're doing such a great job of setting the foundation here. So we have. The enforcement actions. We have Chair Gensler uh, going out and saying these things are securities, a some selection of tokens, not all of them, but some selection, a pretty broad selection are now up to Chair Gensler saying they're securities, right? And so he's doing enforcement actions around those. I got that part. So what are these two legislation efforts and how important are those? And what do they establish for the industry? So there's two active, well, there's a few active bills, but two um, like very active bills. One of them is about stable coins and that one helps, basically it sets forth a regime in which a stable coin that's issued by um, a centralized entity. So not a decentralized like not like die basically, but like a centralized stable coin issuer has to follow this law if it's passed. And okay. it has a bunch of like disclosure requirements and reserve requirements essentially to, um, you know, like avoid what happened with Terra last year and avoid any potential consumer harm, including like fraud, you know, from the issuer. So that's the stablecoin bill. Now okay. there's another bill that's working its way through the house that is called the digital asset market structure. And it's a draft, like a, they, they call it a discussion draft. Um, and that one really helps us understand how tokens can be bought, sold and traded. So it essentially creates these two buckets of tokens. One bucket is to are tokens that are distributed through what the bill calls an end user distribution, which is something like um, a token that's distributed through an airdrop or um, like a mining reward or staking reward, something where you know a disinterested party is receiving a token as for you know some reason or participation wow. on the network. And then the other bucket of tokens is called a restricted digital asset. And those are the tokens that are given to investors of projects or those who are, you know, like employed by the project or working on the project, basically to, um, to like insiders, those who might have information about the token that like the general public doesn't have access to. And so it creates these two different markets. The restricted digital asset market can only be traded on an SEC regulated exchange, whereas the end user distribution tokens can be traded on like any digital commodity exchange because they would be considered commodities rather than um, like this other bucket, which is more akin to securities. So it involves regulation by both the SEC and the CFTC, which is the regulatory body that mm. um, regulates commodities and like commodity futures in this country. So yep. it's like there's there's a lot of um, uncertainties that we're like we're still trying to work out, and we've like provided feedback feedback to the drafters, and there's some back and forth that's happening, but essentially it's trying to add clarity to our industry and to the market yeah. and consumers, which is like really helpful. And that would be the you know ideal place to land. Um, do you do you off the top of your head, just quick from the Q and A, do you happen to know the the numbers of the bills to watch, or or sort of the names? Can you just recap the names and numbers of the bills to watch? Um, so the name of the it's the digital asset market structure. I don't know the numbers off the top of my head, but it was introduced by McHenry, 
yep. Chairman McHenry, who's the chair of the House Financial Services Committee. Um, and it's and I can find it when uh, once you move. Yeah, to we can post uh, it Aaron in the chat. David, I can just send links to them. Yeah, that, that we'll do that in the chat. All right. So we have stable coins about like reserves and what they need to hold and what they need to report and KYC AML around stable coin issuers. That's the stable coin bill. We've got the market structure bill that splits it up between when you're decentralized and when you have insiders, right? And one is regulated by the CTFC with when it's decentralized and the SEC when it's the insiders like project token style. Okay. So those are the two bills. Um, and we have the enforcement actions. I think we're at a place where the groundwork has been set. And so let me pass this to Darren here, which is, Darren, how has how does your work contrast or add to or build off of the legislative work that Marissa is doing with all the feedback and commentary? Like, what is the approach that you're taking that sort of contrasted against this federal regulatory approach? Awesome. Yeah, I can definitely add some color here. Um, I would say like the policy and law landscape is somewhat of a pie here. And not that there's a hierarchy at all. It's more of like there are adjacent territories that are continuously being worked. Um, so Marissa did an amazing job of setting the uh, groundwork at the federal level and explaining why there's such a call for Congress in the first place, right? Um, you know, option A and B might be uh, the regulatory path, we would expect X, Y, and Z, X cooperation with the industry with the goal of creating um, regulatory clarity for good actors to step into the light and make it really easy for us to identify what might be um, misaligned behavior, um, risk of investor protection, all of that. Obviously, now we're at the part where we want um, legislation to pass. And then on the grassroots and community engagement side, I actually really focus on the advocates um, and the crypto enthusiasts, the builders who are here in the United States, um, the companies that want to build uh, a blockchain based business, but just need regulatory clarity to even just get started. And like they can't afford the legal fees to uh, defend themselves against ambiguity. So we focus on our advocates and giving them the tools, uh, the resources, and um, just the knowledge to connect with their policymakers and help make the case that um, there's a better way to be doing uh, policy here in the United States and that other nations are actually taking a very different approach um, to all of this and that we really want uh, clear rules. We don't necessarily wanna wait um, years and years for that to happen. And I think that um, connecting our advocates with their policymakers has actually been a really effective way um, to educate the policymakers on crypto use cases and then build massive awareness um, that crypto is an innovative technology that should have a home here in the United States under the proper, proper regulatory uh, requirements and safeguards, yes. Um, but we also want to make sure that we're uh, proposing fit for purpose legislation. Um, and my final point on, on this whole piece here would be that when you receive a new techno technology like this, um, you ask yourself, is this the same or is this different? Marissa, I think you were alluding to earlier how like what we're dealing with now with these digitally native assets does not necessarily fit the old way and how our international partners have approached this would be, if it is different, then we will approach it with um, you know, new first principled policies. And here, obviously uh, in the United States, we kind of are trying to fit it into this old framework. Um, but the bigger picture is that this is innovation um, that could have profound mm. impacts. Um, and mm. it's it's time to get the legislation right to allow um, the industry the opportunity to even build. So yeah, totally. You know, I was having a conversation in DC the other week with a CFTC commissioner. So uh, uh, one of the commissioners of the CFTC who, who is responsible for regulating commodities and futures, right? And I asked them, you know, have you transacted on chain before? And they had said, no, we're not allowed to, right? We're not allowed to use the technology. And I think what's so great about what you're doing, Darren, is you're going to state court, to state legislative houses, to state governing bodies to federal governing bodies, to projects that are interacting with these lawmakers and getting them to actually 
get their hands on the technology and feel how it's different. And I, I'm curious, David, you know, in your experience with with social media and getting politicians to a place where they started using it, you know, like how do you get them over that hump to to not just taking an opinion about a thing without using it, but actually using it and understanding it and like getting their hands around it and getting their mind along with their hands wrapped around it. Mm -hmm. And like, how does the work of Change Gallery look to advance that? And sort of like, what's your advice for us as, as, as an industry for how to do that given your experience? Yeah, well, first off, let me applaud, you know, both Darren and all the work that they're doing. They're coming to Capitol Hill quite a bit. They're convening. And, uh, you know, they're in the Senate, they're holding meetings, people are coming in. I'm brushing up with Senate staffers uh, that I used to connect with, right? And we're able to have that conversation. So just holding that space, right? Creating those moments where people can brush up against trusted individuals uh, uh, enables a lot of things to move forward, right? And, uh, and also to the Blockchain Association. I mean, I was at an event last week, maybe around pancakes and policy, and it was just extraordinary to hear some of the positive use cases um, that are being presented by author Paul Brody. It's like the number one uh, book uh, right now on Amazon and the business and finance area out of Ernst & Young, talking about the positive use cases of blockchain technology. And overall, I mean, when I started doing, you know, it was 2005 when I started organizing all the press secretaries on Capitol Hill to, to come together and start doing workshops and workshops. And so it was like, we were educating long before the Web2 companies showed up to start lobbying. Mm. I think what we're dealing with right now, just as like a, some of the meta issues are, you know, number one, Web2 broke a lot of promises. You know, I was, I, I never would have done what I was doing then to push people into this had I known that it was going to be the data collection game, you know, and people monetizing everything and all of the web two promises, you know, the, people are deeply skeptical about tech. You know, I read in Punchbowl News that 91% of staffers expect, you know, big tech to be the number one uh, most grilled industry. And then second to that is crypto around 51%. That's ahead of airlines and, you know, energy, sort of everything else. It's those two um, that are number one and number two. So we're dealing with like this deeply skeptical, not a lot of understanding. There's like, like you just pointed out, there's compliance issues. No one's able to go on a journey. Uh, as we all know here who have like tried to mint an NFT or tried to teach someone how to do it, or, you know, the UX is not there. You know, it is still early as an industry, as a technology that has rebuilt from the ground up based on all of the broken promises of Web 2. All of Web 3 said, we have to do this differently, right? And that is where Web 3 is starting from. And yet, you know, we think about, well, email started in 1976, you know, and uh, 14 years from there is like where we, we are from Bitcoin, right? Would have been 1990. So were you ever sending emails in 1990? You know, the first email from space was 1991, which was year 15, right? And that was from a Mac computer, just to sort of like put all of this stuff in the context of like how early it is for something brand new and a technology this revolutionary. But let me just like very quickly point out that like, as I'm talking with regulators and my friends on Capitol Hill, on all sides of the aisle, um, the generals that are sort of building these movements and thinking about this topic, they really care a lot about decentralization and they care a lot about that idea. And they want to know more about this, the like very basics of how this technology works. And I think that as we can start to bring more founders to Washington, D.C., as we can start to bring more entrepreneurs and the innovators, the builders, the core devs have to come to D.C., so that they can teach people about this technology. That's so on point, David. Thank you for making that point. And I kind of want to double click into it and bring Marisa back into here um, because Marisa, that's what the BA does is really helps bring that connection point between founders and legislators. And I'm curious from from your perspective, you know, 
especially like what's timely for us right now is as endowment has joined the BA, you know, we are now one of those use cases. Like what is the role that crypto philanthropy can play in advancing the policy conversation? Where is the overlap of crypto philanthropy and policy conversation as you see it? And what's the value of having this use case on display for legislators? I think it's like such a great and important question because up until recently, I think the narrative of crypto slash digital assets has really been focused on like the financial use case. And with the rise in Web3 and like increased user ownership and all of the benefits that Web3 and decentralization have, the story, like there needs to be a change in narrative away from that financial focus narrative. And I think endowment has like the perfect, it's sort of like in between because in a sense it's financial given that it's helping people use their money for impact, like positive to create positive impact in the world. But then there's like this philanthropic um, narrative that I think it has been lacking on the Hill um, up until recently. So that's where I see the overlap. But I think like we work very hard to try to tell that story um, to those on the Hill. So they understand that like there's a greater purpose of crypto, you know, and blockchain technology that has like some social good attached to it other than just like, you know, people trading tokens and then making money off of that. Right, right. And Marissa, if I, if I may hop in and continue the discussion about use cases, um, that's actually one of the most uh, appreciated aspects of how we show up on the Hill is the fact that we are expanding their awareness of what use cases are. And I believe Coinbase just released a state of crypto report. I can drop the link after I'm done speaking here. But I do want to pull out some like really interesting facts from um, a sample of five uh, Fortune 500 um, CEOs. So when it comes to the top four use cases, 54% uh, 50, of those surveyed are using blockchain as infrastructure and as a uh, data collection and management um, solution. And earlier when David was alluding to the fact that in Web2, we didn't realize that by design, we were actually creating this data collection incentive and data surveillance, I guess, risk. Um, I think that's why so many people are interested in blockchain-based solutions because it's a redesign of an old system. With public blockchains comes tokens, and obviously we layer on these other uh, really key important conversations there. But I think it's really important to explain that the use cases for this are far beyond just finance. Finance is one of many systems that are in need of an update. And um, just focusing on the price is trite so yeah yeah so true um i i i, I want to ask a, a question that might be sort of um i, I don't know hot potato um and, but a safe hot potato a friendly hot potato which is um is this a partisan issue yes or no or why not or why yes, and, and 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 how is it? Maybe is there a dissonance between what it should be and what it is right now, and and how and how do we fix that? And and maybe I'll start with you, David. Yeah, no, I you know this is such an interesting point, and this has been really eye opening to me. Um, you know, SBF made it political. You know, you know, I met with one of the the folks here, and like. You know, as soon as, um, you know, FTX happened, right, FTX, uh, this whole thing, everything became very partisan. And that's when the committees stopped sharing information with one another. They stopped sharing the bills, right? We start to see these skirmishes happening. But also we're seeing it show up like as the num number one campaign issue. Uh, you know, you look at the Senate race in Ohio right now, for example, it's, you know, there's a blockchain candidate actually a blockchain you know entrepreneur um running to take take on Sherrod Brown who's really great individual I mean I know Sherrod pretty well I've known him for a long time and it's it's really concerning to me because I know exactly where he's from I know his neighborhood and I know the issues that he cares about 
Um, you know, he's been a fighter for like the working class for forever. And it's concerning because those are the issues that we help address at Change Gallery, right? We help artists and change makers um, understand how this technology empowers them to make a change in the world, a positive social impact in the world. And so it's just, you know, there's a lot of uh, things around governance, decentralized governance that are really interesting that are coming into play around Web3. So I think by and large, there, it's become partisan, but a lot of that, again, just stems from people getting bad advice. It's a really difficult, complex, technical thing to wrap your head around. You know, it's probably taken all of us a lot of time and we're still learning. That's one thing we're all still learning all the time. And it's, you know, it's not something that you can take a journey on like AI, right? There isn't an app that you can just experience and just try it. And you're like, okay, I got it. You at least have a data point. You know, it takes a while to wrap your head around something that is so revolutionary that it can empower everyone throughout the world to really lift themselves up and have a fair shot. I want can I take like a slightly different view? Um, yeah, please. Like I... I still feel like there is um, bipartisan support for what we're all trying to do. Like we do have champions on the Democratic side, but in my mind, I try to characterize the issue as a nonpartisan issue because I think that is in mo like most alignment with the ethos of blockchain technology and crypto and Web3, et cetera. Um, so that like, I'm hoping that it'll move more in that direction, but David is completely like right on that the calculation did change after FTX. And part of that, what it wasn't just because there was like this massive fraud where a bunch of people lost a lot of money. It was because SBF was so active on the Hill. So there was like not just fraud in the traditional like financial monetary sense, but also fraud on like policymakers. Like they all felt kind of duped. So they are more hesitant to um, lend support when he might have been pushing forth a narrative that is accurate, but didn't apply to FTX, if that makes sense. Yeah. And yeah, and, and Robbie just to put a fine point on it. No, sorry. Go ahead, Darren. Sorry. I'll, and I'll, I'll be very brief, but I want to plus one everything that Marissa and David were uh, saying. Um, I think you're spot on with the analysis there. And I would also perceive it as a nonpartisan issue that needs bipartisan support in order to move forward. Um, and, you know, aligned with the ethos of crypto uh, that necessarily isn't defined by any particular border or domain. Um, it is essentially the internet, a layer that is independent of you know, your nationality. Um, we would want this issue to be about the opportunity for innovation. We think that piece is nonpartisan. It needs bipartisan support if we actually want to move it forward. So, yeah. Yeah, you know, I think like, it feels to me like last year, crypto was kind of taking a back seat, right? It, they were letting the regulatory environment happen to them. Right. And with SBF and FTX falling apart and with Terra Luna falling apart and with the markets cratering, you know, I, I think like I see the crypto community taking a much more proactive stance when it comes to policy and advocacy. And before we open this up to sort of audience questions, I, I want to end on, uh, on a, uh, at least officially, end on a high note here. And and hear from each of you, you know, what is the one thing that you feel like this crypto winter has sparked that is going to make a big difference in making sure that the policy and regulatory framework moves forward rather than is, you know, being reactive? Like, is there something that you think really symbolizes the, the move towards a rational common sense regulatory framework or towards legislative understanding of this technology? Like what is the thing you're excited about that is the product of the forest fire that we went through in 2022? Yeah, I'm happy to start. You know, there is a deep curiosity and interest 
in Web3. People want to know all about it. They want to know the, the, the great stuff. They want to know the bad stuff. They want to know everything about it. They want to learn more about this technology. They want to use it. They want to try it. They want to have like sandboxes, right? And also, you know, on the other side, I'm seeing, as you pointed out, the Web3 community has really woken up. And I think a lot of that is that the people that are here now are the, you know, the ethos is pure, right? Like the people that are still around are not the gamblers or whatever, you know, that kind of world. This, these are the builders, the entrepreneurs, the innovators, and those folks have a little bit of time to pay attention and to just take a breath and say, wait a second, things are going way off track here very quickly. And this could, you know, I could get pushed out of the country, right? My, you know, we are, we all have entrepreneur friends that are moving to Dubai, Singapore, red carpets getting rolled out in London for folks to move. And so like the geographic borders, I think are just, you know, starting to um, open up a little bit because all of us intend to serve a global audience and a global market. Yeah. So that competition is heating up. Like that's the Phoenix from the ashes for you is that there's like this sense of urgency around competition. I vibe with that. All right. Um, uh, uh, Darren, why don't you go, go for it? Same question. Awesome. Yeah, same question. Um, I will start by zooming out and kind of acknowledging what David was alluding to earlier about the fact that other countries are embracing the future of Web3. They're excited to learn about this. Um, you know, A16Z had opened up an office in London. Uh, we're seeing action out of Singapore and Hong Kong. Um, and it's just like a global movement that is obviously widely accepted everywhere else. Here in the United States, we still have a bunch of talent who want to build here. I think I'm proud of the fact that this winter has ignited a true grassroots advocacy base. We can need yeah. to continue to do more to give them the tools to know how to advocate. But even beyond just um, like advocating for pro crypto policy, I think it's ignited an understanding and appreciation for civics in general. People are learning more and more about our process by the sake of having to go through this to, in order to advocate for an issue that they truly care about. So whatever your issue may be, the patterns that our grassroots team are gonna like kind of run you through are helpful regardless. Uh, and obviously we want um, to hold this as a nonpartisan issue and push forward uh, the opportunity for innovation here in the United States. That's a cause that we're um, advocating for. But I think along the ride, a lot of our advocates are also learning so much more about how to be yeah. um, civically engaged. Yeah, that's awesome. You know, I think even just people who are involved in a DAO get a brutal lesson on democracy pretty much right away. Um, and I think it's it's interesting to see not only how, you know, people are are spreading out across the world, but also hunkering down at home and saying, I want my local representatives to understand this, to get why it's a mirror for democracy and aligns with so many of these sort of national values that exist in the US. And so that's that that's what I hear from you there, Darren. And, and I, I think that's a great point. Um, and Marissa, in. maybe for you, just, just the same question, and then we'll open it up to Q&A, Bruce. I see you jumping in here. My bad. <laughs> yeah, and I'll be quick, but I guess the word that comes to mind is focus. I think there's a focus on building and weeding out the noise um, that like sort of naturally happens in a, um, like a, I guess a bear market, but it's really like building the applications using this technology that like can really impact people's lives in a positive way. So that's how how I see. All right. Well, um, that was, we could talk about that for another whole hour. We could have done just an hour of Marissa explaining the enforcement actions. And um, and so uh, thank you guys. Um, I do want to open this up to some of the Q&A that we got from, uh, from the audience. Um, there was one thing that I did want to hit on really quickly that came up very early, which is um, about the enforcement action. So maybe Marissa, if we can come back to you, can you talk briefly, briefly about 
the SEC versus Ripple case, as well as another enforcement action and what that means for the space. And do you see any sort of coincidence in the timing of the Citadel Schwab Fidelity backed exchange alongside the enforcement actions against Coinbase and Binance? And, you know, like, how do all these how do all these things connect? Is there an undercurrent here? Yeah, really good questions. Um, so I guess first on Ripple, Ripple has been in like being litigated for, I believe, three years now. So that case was filed when like before Chair Gensler came on. It was like filed during Chair uh, Clayton. And uh, it's right now in the stage is called summary judgment, which is like the final stage before a case goes to trial. And the court has an opportunity to uh, issue a ruling that is like a final determination on the merits of the case. Um, I think we'll probably see a ruling this summer, maybe this fall. But um, as I'm sure many of you know, this case has been like heavily litigated. And I think, I guess, two takeaways from it. Um, and it concerns whether the XRP token is a security. Um, and then, you know, Ripple as the issuer of XR XRP, if XRP is a security, then they would have violated the security right. laws by not registering the token with the SEC first. Right. Um, but I guess like the two big takeaways, one is even if the ruling does not go in Ripple's favor, it's the the ruling wouldn't be precedential for other cases because it's just in the trial court level. But I would think that Ripple would appeal an adverse ruling. And we haven't yet seen an appellate court rule on these issues. So I'm hoping this issue gets to the Supreme Court at some point. Um, because I think it's just ripe for that high level review. So one takeaway is to like, just keep in mind that even if the ruling does not go in Ripple's favor, like that ruling doesn't necessarily set precedent for other cases. Mm -hmm. Um, and then the other takeaway is just like how heavily this case was litigated. And I would expect, um, the Binance and Coinbase cases to be litigated just as heavily, which means that we probably won't see any substantive ruling in those cases for like, I don't know, at least two years. So, wow. Wow. Uh, and then that's, the yeah, that's, that, that's very helpful. Um, you know, what about some of the things that we've seen around Prometheum and them being the first qualified custodian that's SEC approved, even though the SEC doesn't approve qualified custodians. Fun fact about qualified custodians, there is no qualification process for being a qualified custodian. I learned this recently. Um, you just sort of do it and people get to say that they're a qualified custodian. Um, but regardless, like what is, do you see any nefariousness in the timing of like the Prometheum, uh, you know, FINRA accreditation as a broker dealer or the, you know, new Schwab Fidelity uh, exchange? Does that seem fishy to you or does this just seem like, you know, conspiracy theory? I mean, I, it seems fishy enough that the Blockchain Association submitted a FOIA request to the SEC on the topic. So we're like doing our own internal, or I guess Thank not, you. but our own investigation yeah. to it. see if there's anything backing up. Um, essentially, like the theory is that um, Prometheum and the founders, in particular, Aaron Kaplan, who's been like the face of this whole controversy. Um, is like parroting Chair Gensler and trying to hmm. throw off efforts by Congress to enact legislation that cl clarifies um, the path forward for digital assets, because hmm. the narrative that Prometheum is expressing is essentially like there's already a clear path. Um, hmm, that these are all securities, we agree, and right. we're going to treat these like securities, and that's why we're legitimate. Right. Even though they did achieve a license to operate as a special purpose broker dealer, but like they haven't launched and it would be impossible for them to list anything because it's impossible for tokens to actually register. So sort of uh, Got it. Catch, catch 22. 22. Yeah. Okay. That's interesting context. So it feels more like window dressing than it does like real action here. 
Yeah. And I think like the narrative that they're spreading is harmful in the sense of like, there is extreme lack of clarity to the point where Congress has recognized that. And there's yeah. draft legislation working its way through Congress to help provide that clarity. So like the counter narrative is harmful to that effort. All right, cool. Um, I want to go to uh, a question from uh, someone who is also going to be a presenter in a breakout room, but from Brennan at ATX DAO, who was asking a little bit more, you know, ATX DAO, for those who don't know, is a community-led DAO in Austin that recently just tried to introduce legislation into the Texas House of Representatives, I believe, um, and fought valiantly, but was not able to get a Dow legislation bill passed. Um, Brennan just linked it in the in the chat here. But um, Brennan, Brennan was asking you, Darren, is there somewhere that they could get connected with all of Coinbase's efforts here around advocacy and policy? And like, where are the best resources here? And, and where do you suggest that they start, Darren, and or, or continue their fight? It's like past starting at this point. You know, like, where should they continue their fight? Where should they take it next? Where should they take it next? I think that's a great question, Brennan. And I would actually, I'll, I'll dig into some of the details that you shared here. Um, although I'm not a lawyer and nor do I have any legal advice to share here, um, I do see a couple of um, opportunities. So obviously our Samuel Crypto movement around advocacy is designed to increase awareness um, around August recess is a great window to actually connect directly with your policymakers. This is when they're back in their home districts uh, and they're hearing the actual, um, you know, the pleas of the constituents. So I would definitely encourage you to take advantage of August recess and connect with your local policymakers. I do know Austin specifically has been really friendly to um, just Web3 in general, being host to many um, major conferences. And obviously DAOs are one of the many topics within the Web3 ecosystem that are extremely complicated um, and kind of a behemoth. So, I mean, if there are any DAO experts on our panel who can kind of help um, offer any proof points to uh, DAOs that have successfully fought for either legal status or um, yeah. there's cases out there, you know, I definitely recommend that. But for right now, I'd say like your uh, direct advocacy routes can also be really effective. Right on. And then uh, maybe. Yeah, go ahead. Out. No, 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 go ahead. No, I, um, I was also going to tag in David just in case uh, with your years of experience on the Hill, you might actually know. Um, from a historical perspective, how this could play out. Yeah, absolutely. So the the DAO piece is an, a really interesting one. So Change DAO uh, is sort of the parent organization of Change Gallery, um, the marketplace. And so yeah, I've I've delved very deeply into DAO legislation. We actually filed first in Wyoming, which uh, Wyoming created the first LLC. So you know everyone has an LLC. Well, Wyoming started that. You know, most people don't realize that Wyoming is always like the innovator when it comes to to, to these things. Um, you know, we took a look at the filing requirements and realized that it wasn't, it was actually too ridiculous. Um, you know, we, we would have had to file every single smart contract, which for change now, as Robbie knows, like, you know, every single project is a smart contract. Um, and so we just felt like it was, it wasn't the right approach. Also a concern of who would be reading Solidity <laughs> code, because, you know, that's what a smart contract is. Um, so, you know, all of those pieces were why we stepped away and just created a, you know, our baseline legal governance is an LLC in De Delaware, um, like probably a lot of folks still. And that gives us, you know, ability to pay our taxes, to, um, you know, protect our IP and so on and so forth. Yep. But when it yep. comes to... A, a DAO, and I'll just close on this. Um, I think the more interesting piece is to look around co-ops and cooperatives. Yeah. Cooperatives were created hundreds of years ago, um, you know, by farmers. And so, yeah, I would focus on cooperatives and the folks that are looking at cooperatives and how DAO instruments yeah. can help sort of cooperatives uh, proceed. Yeah, there's great research from a, a legal group um, around 
uh, a couple of different law firms, as well as LexDAO, who I know we have in the audience today, that have worked on some various research around cooperatives and securities laws. And that's another really interesting avenue. Um, last question for the group before we wrap up here. Uh, there's a few questions here about philanthropic legislation or around like crypto appraisals. And I, I'm wondering, you know, for David and Marissa, you know, like, do you see any progress in the legislative front around how you appraise NFTs or how you think about donations or how to think about like, is there any risk in taking a donation? We often say at endowment, you know, we're giving you dollars, right? So like we take on the risk of taking in the, the donation as the crypto asset, but like for a nonprofit that's looking at taking in a donation of something that might be a security, is there any risk for them there? And how should they think about, you know, legislative battles when it comes to charitable giving? Is it something that really intersects? Yeah, I'm happy to start. Um, I don't know of any legislation that is like specifically targeted toward charitable giving. Uh, I do know that the IRS has um, is like working through some guidance on how to categorize NFTs um, and like whether NFTs should be considered collectibles under the tax code. But I think there's obviously like heightened regulatory risk as to whether a token constitutes a security. So to the extent an organization is holding tokens that the SEC has deemed a security and one of their enforcement actions, even though there's no like court ruling on that. Um, so there's no like final determination of that fact. There could be heightened risk in terms of like well, what can the organization then do with those tokens? Yeah. Because if you sell those tokens, then it's possible the SEC believes that they are selling unregistered securities. So I think, but but I don't view like an organization in any um, different of like a regulatory, like trying to mitigate that regulatory risk than anyone else who might be holding tokens. And the SEC thinks yeah. that they're all securities. So you know, there's only yeah, like so really much workable framework. Yeah. Yeah. Um, David, anything to add there? Yeah, I would just, uh, you know, advise like, you know, we're really proud to work with endowment and, and the giving block. You know, when it comes to nonprofits for us, we think it's best to, you know, work with partners that are paying attention to these things, are watching the bills very closely, are members of trade associations, are engaged in following along and bringing their voice to the table and participating. Yeah, like Robbie. Uh, so for, yeah, so for us, I mean, we work with the artists and so we want to ensure that the artist is able to sort of work with organizations and, and be able to gift these you know, the sales of the revenue, right, from the sales from these NFTs to the nonprofits, and they want to uplift them in the stories of their art, right? And so, yeah, for us, it just is so much easier for us whenever there's like, we're in a gray period, right? Um, there's a lot of gray areas happening right now. And so for us, it's just like, that's why having partners at the table with you, whether it's a advisor or your own legal department to help you know, your tax attorneys, you know, everyone can help you make the right decisions. Cool. Well, I think that's a great place for us to bundle this up. Um, what a killer discussion. I really appreciate all three of you being here today. Um, uh, you know, a, a major takeaway here for the audience is, um, we're happy to connect you with any of these resources. We'll be sharing um, all of the mentioned bills and all of the mentioned resources. Um, and if you have any questions about this, this is a changing landscape. It's changing by the week, by the day. So, um, you know, working with anybody on this panel on these questions and reaching out to us is something we'd be happy to happy to receive. And um, yeah, thanks again to, to Marissa, Darren, and David. Um, uh, Thank you so much for being here today and and Godspeed on all of your efforts. We, we look forward to seeing you guys uh, fighting the good fight for crypto going forward. Thanks for having us, Robbie. Yeah, thank you. And for your team, they're awesome in organizing this. Oh, yeah, thanks a lot. Thanks, everyone.